Now on to opportunistic fungal infections. As the name implies, these infections only happen in immunocompromised hosts who can't mount an immune response. If you see these infections in your patients, you should probably start looking for causes for their immunocompromise. Candida albicans is part of the normal skin flora. Factors such as antibiotics, or steroid use, or cancer, and other immunocompromised states are going to increase the risk for developing a variety of different infections because your body doesn't have the ability to mount a strong response. Candida can affect several parts of the body. In fact, you can see oral or esophageal thrush, vulvovaginitis, diaper rashes, and endocarditis in IV drug users. Thrush and esophagitis are two really big signs of underlying immunocompromise. Here's a picture of oral thrush. It appears as a cottage cheese looking discharge on the tongue. Here's a little head and neck cancer correlate for you. Can you think of the term for the white plaque on the tongue that is a precancerous lesion? The word I'm thinking of is leukoplakia, literally white plaque. Now, how do you differentiate between the two? Well, all you're going to need is a tongue depressor. If you can scrape that white material off the tongue with a depressor, then what is your diagnosis? Thrush. And if not, then you're looking at leukoplakia. But IV drug users can be affected by candida too. Let's throw in some cardiology. Do you remember which valve is more likely to be infected by candida in an IV drug user? The tricuspid. Here's the tricuspid valve. The tricuspid valve is more likely to be affected in endocarditis and IV drug users. Now, which gram-negative bacteria did we discuss that can cause endocarditis in these IV drug users? That would be Pseudomonas. Bear in mind that Staph aureus is actually the most common cause of acute endocarditis. But associate Canada with cottage cheese discharge. Some more serious candidal infections can include disseminated candidiasis to other organs, which usually occurs in neutropenic patients. So remember, if you don't have neutropils, then you're neutropenic. Neutropenia is going to lead to mucocutaneous candidiasis. And chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis, which as its name suggests, is characterized by chronic candidal infections of mucocutaneous surfaces, such as the skin and the nails. This is seen in patients with T-cell immunodeficiencies, so they're going to be low on their T-cells. Because candida is a dimorphic species, at 20 degrees Celsius, candida appears as pseudohyphae and budding yeast, which you can see here. When candida is grown in animal serum at 37 degrees, you see little germ tubes, which are shown here. These germ tubes are diagnostic for Candida albicans. Aspergillus fumigatus is a fungus that causes various lung diseases in immunocompromised hosts. You'll need to know what Aspergillus looks like because often you'll be shown a stain and asked to identify the type of fungus. Aspergillus is found in acutely branching angles, usually what appears to be about 45 degrees. Here's a stain micrograph showing those acute angles. Now, note here that these angles, again, they're acute. So, whereas some of the pictures I'm going to show you are going to have branching angles that are greater than 90 degrees or even equal to 90 degrees, notice that aspergillus is going to be acute or less than 90 degrees. The other thing that I want you to take note of is that these fungal organisms are septate. They're going to have septate hyphae. So you're going to see these little lines dividing the little organisms. These lines here. These are the septa. Now this is again going to be very important when we contrast aspergillus to other invasive fungal organisms. So what are the key diseases caused by aspergillus? Well, it can stimulate an IgE response leading to bronchospasm known as allergic bronchopulmonary 
aspergillosis, or ABPA. This is more common in patients with asthma and cystic fibrosis. Do you know what you might see on a complete blood count on a person with ABPA? If you got a differential on your WBCs, you'd see eosinophilia, so increase in the eosinophils. Aspergillus can also grow inside of existing lung cavities and form what is known as an aspergilloma, or fungus ball. Can you think of an infectious disease that causes cavitary lung lesions? Remember that tuberculosis can cause cavitary lung lesions, and this is prime real estate for aspergillomas to form. Radiographically, you will see a large round focus within a cavitary lesion. If the patient changes position, so will the fungus ball. The aspergilloma is this opacity in the right lung apex, so you can see the opacity pretty well here. Again, remember that the key to reading these images on step one is looking for asymmetry. So you can see here, there's an opacity here that does not appear on the left side. Some aspergillus species can produce aflatoxins, which have been linked to hepatocellular carcinoma, or HCC. These aflatoxins are often found in moldy peanuts. And finally, from the lung parenchyma, aspergillus can invade the bloodstream and cause invasive aspergillosis, which causes blood vessel occlusion and pulmonary infarction. Other organisms can also be affected, including the liver and the kidneys. Cryptococcus neoformans has a very characteristic appearance on stain as well. Do you remember the shape? It is usually found in narrow-based budding yeast form, and there is a specific stain that you'd use to identify it. What stain am I showing you here? This is an India ink stain. If you ever see the words India ink on your test, think of cryptococcus. Cryptococcus, when you see India ink. As you can see here in this image, crypto stains well with India ink because of its thick polysaccharide capsule. That's what you see right here. That's the thick polysaccharide capsule. So what is the classic disease that cryptococcal infection that is always tested on boards? Let's say you have an AIDS patient, presents with a CD4 count of 92, and he's having headaches and fevers. What diagnosis are you going to suspect? I hope you are at least considering cryptococcal meningitis as a diagnosis. In fact, cryptococcus is considered a quote-unquote AIDS-defining illness since it can only occur when CD4 count is less than 200. This means if you see a patient with cryptococcus, you know that patient's CD4 count is automatically less than 200. It is also an opportunistic infection in other immunocompromised patients, especially chemotherapy patients and organ transplant recipients as those patients are also profoundly immunosuppressed. So what is the classic source of cryptococcus that is usually described in your board questions? It's found in pigeon and bird droppings and acquired through inhalation. So as you may suspect, in a homeless person, they may have AIDS, and if they're living in a big city, then you're going to want to think cryptococcus. In addition to the India ink stain, what is another diagnostic test that is commonly used for cryptococcus? The latex agglutination test is commonly used for diagnosis of cryptococcus as well. Basically, you take some latex particles, you mix them, and these latex particles are special because they have anti-cryptococcal antibody attached to them. And now you're going to mix that with the patient's spinal fluid or serum. If they have a cryptococcal infection, the antibody on the latex particles will react with cryptococcus's polysaccharide capsule or antigen, and this will cause agglutination of the latex particles. In addition to cryptococcal meningitis, where the lining of the brain is infected, sometimes patients develop a cryptococcoma in the gray matter of the brain as well. Do you remember the description of the histopathological findings in this disorder? 
The gray matter is sometimes described as having soap bubble lesions or small cyst-like spaces. Here's an MRI showing a cryptococcoma. Notice that it forms a ring-enhancing lesions in the brain. That you can see right there. Hang on a second. Can you think of another AIDS-defining illness that appears as a ring-enhancing lesion on brain imaging? I'm thinking of toxoplasmosis. We're going to cover toxo in more detail later, so hang on to that. Keep in mind that if a patient you suspect has cryptococcal infection, you're going to want to treat them with amphotericin B and flucytosine. You can also prevent meningitis in these patients with antifungal prophylaxis using fluconazole. Our last opportunistic fungal species is the Rhizopus mucor family. This fungus can often be mistaken for aspergillus, but if you remember the key differences, you'll get this one right every time. Rhizopus mucor and aspergillus both have branching hyphae. As you can see here, however, the branches of rhizopus occur at 90 degree angles. Remember I talked about how those angles in aspergillus were going to be important later? Well, now we can see that these angles are 90 degrees. Here's the image of aspergillus from before. As you can see, these angles are much closer to 45 degrees. There is one key difference that I also spoke of before. And remember that aspergillus had septated hyphae, which just means that they are segmented or divided into individual cells. See the septa here and here. Okay, so quick review. Aspergillus branches at how many degrees? 45. And how about mucor? 90. Good. And more and more irregularly. Excellent. Mucormycosis is a feared infection in patients who are immunocompromised. What you'll typically see is a patient with diabetic ketoacidosis who will present with fever, headaches, and facial pain. Do you know what part of the head and neck is most commonly affected by mucor? The nasal cavity. Mucor can start here, proliferate within the sinuses, and then enter the blood vessels or even physically spread through the cribriform plate into the brain or ocular cavity. On your boards, you'll see a description of a patient presenting in an immunocompromised state, such as in DKA or on chemotherapy. This patient will have cranial nerve deficits and a headache. Physical exam will likely show edema of the face or eyes, reproducible cranial neuropathy, and necrotic appearing nasal mucosa. What is the treatment for invasive fungal sinusitis? The textbook answer is to use a three-pronged approach for treatment. The first thing you'll want to do is aggressive surgical debridement. You need to remove all diseased tissue, and sometimes there is extensive involvement of the head and neck. Unfortunately, even vital structures like the eye must sometimes be sacrificed. The second is to gain control of the underlying immunocompromised state if possible. So if the patient is in florid DKA, you would aggressively treat their diabetes and correct the metabolic derangements. Finally, like in most systemic fungal disease, you'll need to use an antifungal agent. Go with the powerful ones in this case. You'll need to use amphotericin B. Okay, so just to make sure we are all on the same page with how this terrible disease wreaks havoc on anything it touches, remember, spores are inhaled through the nose and mouth and these fungi then undergo angio invasion into the mucosa. This is a key step in the pathogenesis. They actually invade blood vessel walls and proliferate. This invasion of the vessel wall causes necrosis and then thrombosis. That's why when you look in the nose or mouth, you'll actually see black necrotic tissue. And if you go and debride it surgically, it won't bleed. Once they're in the nose, nothing stops them from going through the cribriform plate and spreading intracranially. Let's do another high-yield clinical scenario. A 65-year-old man with acute myelogenous leukemia is hospitalized for chemotherapy induction. On day four, he develops right eye swelling and severe right-sided facial pain. What is the most likely diagnosis? 
Okay, let's think about this one together. The clues here are AML, induction of chemotherapy, and severe facial pain. Put these three things together and what do the boards want you to say? Invasive fungal sinusitis. And the organism they will commonly want you to identify is mucor. Let's just drop a few more small nuggets of knowledge while we're here. Can you think of one other fungal organism that can cause invasive fungal sinusitis? Actually, it is aspergillus. Do you remember how to differentiate aspergillus from mucor on histological section? Mucor has aseptate hyphae that branch roughly at 90 degree angles, whereas aspergillus hyphae are septate and acute angle branching. Remember that on nasal endoscopy, you will see black necrotic mucosa that is insensate. This is a really sensitive finding for invasive fungal sinusitis. You can get an MRI if you suspect the diagnosis, but the only way to confirm diagnosis is with a pathological specimen showing angio invasion of fungal hyphae. That's when the fungal hyphae actually invade the blood vessels. So you will need to do aggressive surgical debridement. And what is the antifungal of choice? Amphotericin B, excellent job. 